that you are alive and powerful, and that the second that we put our trust in you, you begin to impart purpose into every single one of our lives. And though the enemy may come and try to destroy us and kill us and, and get us off track, your plan is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and you love us, and that the, the very... Uh, idea that there is still breath inside of our lungs allows us to know that you are not finished with us yet, that you have a purpose for each and every one of our lives, no matter where our steps might take us in this land throughout this world, you are, are there, you are calling those to you, and if we would simply just trust in your word and the thing that you deposited in us, lives around us would be changed forever. So Lord, I pray today, God, rebuild that confidence that once was there, that boldness to speak in love of who you are. Lord, I pray that today that, that your word, your seed would go forth on, on fertile soil. I ask God that it would produce fruit and fruit that remains. And Lord, I pray that everywhere we go, lives might be changed because you first changed us. And I ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I'm so excited to uh, be back with you. Uh, for those of you that, uh, that don't know who I am, my name is John Abner. I uh, am a friend of Moses. Uh, and uh, I am a City of Mount Dora employee. That pretty much just sums up a father, a husband. Um, but I love the word of God. Uh, God gave me an opportunity uh, many years ago to have opportunity to share his word, and um, I, I don't do it near as often as I used to, or really probably near as often as I should, right. but when the opportunity comes, I am humbled and thankful for it, so thank you for being here today. Uh, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 3. I was uh, singing and, and praying uh, over there during worship, and uh, one of the things that I, I had to kind of laugh about uh, as I thought of it was um, from the moment that I gave my life to the Lord and began a relationship with Him through His Word, um, I never asked for anything as far as ministry goes. I never asked to be a youth pastor. I never asked to be a lead pastor. I never asked for any speaking engagements. I didn't ask to be a chaplain at the hospital or at the jail or, or uh, for the sheriff's department. I didn't ask uh, to, to have opportunity to teach in seminary in Russia. I didn't ask to be on TV. I didn't ask for any of that. Um, the only thing I asked uh, when my wife and I got married and we moved to, to Central Florida, the only thing I asked um, our senior pastor was, uh, what, what can I do to help, to serve? And, and I'm going to be honest with you, um, it, it, it wasn't glamorous. Uh, it, it was cleaning, and it was doing electric work, and I can remember one night uh, spending, uh, Kendra and I, and I uh, about a half hour, an hour, uh, trying to get gum out of the carpet. Uh, nothing was glamorous about it, and, and I, I didn't think that lives were being changed, but I just wanted to serve. That was simply it. And then God uses that heart posture to begin to open up purpose and, and, and bigger things than we can ever imagine in, uh, uh, through our lives. And so um, I am and thankful to be here now, and I, and I feel like today the, the word that I want to share uh, I'm kind of preaching to the choir because I, I know your hearts and, and I know your desire to serve, but I just want to uh, reassure you of God's plan in the midst of that and, and confirm your why. You know, why do I serve? Why do we continue to do these things? And I hope uh, that at the end of the day that we're encouraged together uh, to continue down that path. Um, because the reality is, is that the, the, the climate of this nation, 
um, politically and, and fear because of this virus, or uh, if you have to get up and go to work tomorrow, um, or, or whatever it might be, unknown of what the future for revolution is, like whatever it might be, it is a, a, um, a very fertile soil for there to be uh, division and concern and fear. And, and if we remind ourselves who God says we are, what he's done in our lives, it will allow us to go forth and, and be the people that he's called us to be. And so Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, it's a, a passage that I, I know all of you are familiar with, um, but I, I just want to uh, hang out here for just a few minutes this morning. Now Peter and John, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so just follow along in, in your translation. We're going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong and leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Now, one of the things that I want you to understand this morning is what we're seeing happen in Acts chapter 3 is really what biblical community, or being part of a faith family, ought to be all about. And, 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 and one of the things that I love about the, the uh, book of Acts written by Luke is it's this amazing uh, uh, passage of scripture that really doesn't have an end. Every other book that you read in the Bible, it has a very nice, clear ending. It says, amen, or that was it, or, or however it concludes. But this book, Acts, and really a, a better uh, uh, title for it is Acts of the Apostles, it doesn't have an ending. And the reason it doesn't have an ending is because this book is still being written on the lives of those that are still following Jesus. And so what we do when we go back to the book of Acts is we find out what the early church did, how they had success, and then we fast forward a couple thousand years and determine how does that play out how does that look in our lives as we gather as a faith family to worship him? And so what I want to do is I want you to see three characteristics this morning uh, of the early church. And, and I want to touch on how that plays out in our lives as a body of believers. So what made the early church different? Number one. They were people that were concerned about the hurts of people around them. They were people that were concerned about the hurts of people around them. Peter and John, they're walking into the temple, as is the custom, to pray around the ninth hour. This was one of the places that they would gather as a part of the New Testament church and as they're walking towards the temple, they see this guy sitting there that the scripture indicates had been crippled from birth. So he didn't get hurt that week. He didn't get hurt several years before. It says that he had been crippled since birth. We don't know exactly how old he is, but we do know that there was never a time when he could walk. There was never a time when he wasn't lame. And so this guy is there and he is set apart from the rest of society. He was one of the neediest people in culture, crippled since birth. Many people would often during this time attribute uh, uh, an injury or uh, a need like this to sin. 
They would say, well, you know, he must have sinned in his life in order to be like this. And if we're not careful, we do the same thing in people's lives. We ask them uh, what they did in order to get there instead of asking them what they need. And so they would attribute to sin and say, well, it's not this guy's sin. He was this way since he was born. Well, then clearly it was his family's sin. You know, they must have done something. That was one of the issues that uh, Kendra and I faced when we were in Russia. Uh, we were there um, dealing, uh, helping uh, uh, families educate and um, minister to children with special needs. And one of the things that uh, parents, especially mothers in Russia, deal with if they have a child with special needs is uh, people, society looks at them and blames them. And so the suicide rate amongst mothers with children with special needs in Russia is through the roof. Because in their entire lives, they hear this is their fault. They've done something. What did you do? Same thing happens 2,000 years ago. Well, this guy didn't do something because he was born this way. So clearly, his family must be jacked up in order to cause this. And so in order to make themselves feel better, they would sit him out at the temple. And it was a custom and almost a requirement for those walking into the temple to, to throw him a little change. Not really care about him, but just make themselves feel a little bit better about throwing a little bit of change in the bucket. Now, I can tell you this, I learned this a long time ago, nothing, it's just a side note, don't be offended if this has been you in the past, it'll never be you again, <laughs> nothing indicates our heart more clearly than a good old-fashioned food drive. Because some of y'all in the past have gone to the back of that pantry with those dusty yams and said, this is a great time to clean out the pantry. <laughs> I, it's not good enough for me, but they're hungry. So I'm going to give them all the stuff that I don't want to eat. And we throw it in to the jar. And we feel really good about ourselves because we gave. And that's what's happening here. They don't really care that there's a need. They're not really concerned with what they're giving. There's just a, a, a cultural responsibility to every once in a while throw some change in the bucket. And so undoubtedly, you guys will forgive me for that comment later. <laughs> undoubtedly, they've seen him before. And I want you to see the progression of what's happening here. One, we must see the hurt of those around us. Peter and John, they notice this guy. They're walking by on this day. Some are giving without really being compassionate. Some are just walking by and ignoring him. Some of them are saying, you know what? I gave to him last week. I'm not going to give to him this week. Or I gave in the office. I don't need to give again. Some people uh, uh, are doing the same things that, that, that we do today. I grew up around a, a big city, and I often saw people outside begging for money. And I saw the poverty, and I saw the homeless, and I'll be honest, we eventually get to a place where we see it so much that we just become numb to it. We just kind of even uh, are able to ignore it as though it's not even happening. And, and certainly that happens here with people that have been going to this temple week after week, day after day. This guy's always here. He's almost like a decoration. To the gate beautiful. And so some see him and drop in some change. Some just see him and they walk by. Some don't even notice him at all. But the first thing that we've got to do is we've got to see the hurt of people around us. The second thing that happens is not only do we see the hurt, we feel the hurt. Verse 4 says that Peter directed his gaze at him. It says he stared right at him. He didn't just notice in his peripheral that this guy was still here. He gazed right at him. And, and this is a, a term that Luke has used before. Uh, the first time that we see Luke use this is, is back in Acts chapter 1. If you just want to turn a couple pages to the left, verse 10, this is, is worth saying. It's, this is as Jesus is ascending up into heaven right before their very eyes. And it says, while they were gazing into heaven, he went. Behold, two men stood by them in their white robes and said, uh, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, he'll come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. 
And so the first time that Luke uses this, this term for, for looking or gazing at something is here in Acts chapter 1. Now let me just, uh, a little sidebar, Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, Jesus ascends to heaven, and, and the, the guys, they're just, they're just standing there looking. In all, maybe waiting to see what happens next. Maybe Jesus got hungry, he's having some lunch, and he's going to come back later. Like, what's happening right now? But understand our posture. We look into heaven and we worship because he ascended. But what happens when the men come? They say, listen, this same Jesus that ascended into heaven, he's coming back. And so, yes, we look up and worship in awe of who he is and what he's done. But then we have to direct our gaze back down here to earth because he's coming back. Right? So we look up and worship, but we look out and work because he's coming back. And so this is the first time that Luke uses this term of gazing, of feeling this uh, heart, of looking upon these people. It's a look of intent or amazement. It's a, it's a deep gaze at something. Um, it's how Luke... Uh, pictures these men looking to heaven in Acts chapter 1. It's the same thing that we see here in Acts chapter 3. It's uh, the same word that Luke uses in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen is about to be stoned and it says he stares up into heaven seeing Jesus standing at this point. He stands up at the right hand of Father. And so it's this same word and Luke is being very intentional about Peter and John not just glancing at some guy and being like, hey, what's up? But instead stopping and staring, looking deep into this person. Luke wants them to wants us, the reader, to know that Peter and John had not just uh, an ability to see this hurt, but they were emotionally involved. And so we see the hurt of people around us. Number two, we feel the hurt of people around us. And then the third thing is we touch the hurt. We touch the hurt. So we see it, we feel it, and we touch it. The guy says, what are you going to give me? Are you going to give me some money? That's what everybody else does. That's why I'm here. I'm trying to help provide for my caretakers, for my family. So are you guys gonna, gonna, gonna give me something? You're looking at me, what are you gonna do? And Peter and John, they, they say, well, we don't have any silver. We don't have any gold. But what we do have, we give you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And Peter reaches down and he touches this guy. He grabs him by the right hand, this guy that is left out of every bit of culture and society. Peter and John, they reach down and they touch the hurt. And this man gets up and he begins to walk. And not only does he begin to walk, but when our hurt has been helped, we uh, have this passion for worship. And so not only does he get up and he walk, but he begins to praise the name of Jesus. And so how does this look in our lives? Because as much as I would love to see this type of thing like happen in my life, and as much as I believe that it does and that it's possible, the reality is it just never has. I've never reached down to a man that can't walk, grab him by his right hand and him get up and start walking. It happens and it should happen. I've never had it happen through my life. But that doesn't mean that I can't see, feel, and touch hurt. And so how does it happen in our lives? We live in an era of technology where it's very easy for us to see hurt and tragedy. It's on the front page of our social media. It's on every single news outlet. We see that not only are there needs throughout our country, but there are needs throughout the world. But what does it mean in my life and in your life to go from just seeing those things to where we're really helping those things? We can live a busy life accomplishing seemingly good things without ever lifting a finger to help someone in need. And this is uh, not just in culture, but also amongst a body of believers. There are needs and hurts 
that are represented here today. There are needs and hurts that are represented all over Leesburg. Needs and hurts represented all over Lake County. And, and we have to figure out in our laid down lives how we can engage ourselves in helping those needs. Because here's the reality. A group of people that gather together desiring to do good but never do. A group of people that are disconnected from the needs of their community is an inauthentic group. So we can gather all we want. And ah, this is a personal struggle of mine. This has nothing to do with you. <laughs> there have been moments in my life where I was in the deepest need. Hurt, wore down, ready to give up. And I'm going to be honest. A brother or sister in Christ just looking at me, kind of not gazing, but glancing and saying, brother, I'm going to pray for you. Yeah. Well, I'm not feeling. Thanks. <laughs> but no thanks, really. Because you can just feel it, right? Like there's no feeling the hurt. They, they, they're not, they're not, they're not going through what I'm going through. They're not, they're not taking the time to really feel what I'm feeling. And so I'm not telling you, I'm just saying, let's be careful. Pray, please, Jesus, pray for me. But not with a, a passing thought that is inauthentic. And so, uh, what does it look like when we see need, hurt, we feel need, and we touch needs? What is the secondary consequence of being a faith family that sees needs in Leesburg, feels needs in Leesburg, and touches those needs in Leesburg? The New Testament, specifically the book of Acts, gives us clarity of what that looks like. In Acts chapter 2 verse 41, one of the things it says is that those who received his word were baptized and those that were added that day were about 3,000 souls. And so you've got a body of believers that are seeing hurt, feeling hurt, and touching hurt. And the results of that is lives being changed for all eternity. This church, this New Testament church, goes from 120 people to 3,120 people. That's pretty good growth. You go to Acts chapter 4, verse 4, and it says, The many of those that heard the word and believed the number of men came out to be about 5,000. And so we went from 120 to 3,120 to 8,120. That's massive growth. And it's, it's a, a church, a, a faith family that is growing at breathtaking speeds. And right in the middle of all of this growth is Luke telling us, painting a picture of Peter and John reaching out to a person that nobody else cared about. That everybody else had forgotten. That he was an outcast in society, probably looked at as a nuisance to those around him. So I want you to see and understand that the, the, the truth that the New Testament church had that we need to hang on to today, and, and this, is your, this is your Twitter moment. This is, this is the tweet. Those who are most effective at reaching the many are the ones who are most passionate about reaching the one. Those that are most effective at reaching the many are the ones that are most passionate about reaching the one. This doesn't start within these four walls. It starts at home in our community. It starts with the neighbor. It starts with the co-worker. It starts with the, the guy or gal that we see every time we go to the store. It starts with the one person that we're 
just passionate, not, not necessarily about beating them over the head with the Bible or, or, or holding on to their hand until they accept Jesus, but just them seeing something different in my life because I said yes to Jesus. That's how change, that's how true, breathtaking growth happens through a faith family in a community. The mark of the New Testament church, yes, they were growing rapidly, but the mark of the church was that they cared about one, yep. just one. Remember this in Luke chapter 15, he says, who of you having a hundred sheep wouldn't leave the 99 to go after the one? one? And we get so caught up, especially in church culture, about the right lighting and the right music and the right tempo and the right this and the right that. The church doesn't need any of those things. It doesn't need the right parking or the right uh, children's church worker or even the right person standing on the platform. The church needs a body of people that all care about one person. Amen. One person. If each and every one of us would focus on it, our gaze... That one hurting person in our life, I promise you, Revolution, you would turn this city upside down for Amen. Jesus. Amen. That's the, the, the plan that God laid out in Acts, and it's the plan that still exists today. We don't need to buy a book down at the mall, seven steps to growth in the church. we got to open our word and then... Follow it, emulate it, do what they did and not make it harder than it has to be because God knows I am a simpleton. <laughs> and if he made this hard, I would fail. And I do all the time. But every once in a while, we get it right. And this is how it starts. They reached out and they felt the hurts around them. They were following the pattern that was set forth by Jesus. And so here they are hanging out with this guy for a few years. He ascends to sit at the right hand of the Father. They don't really want to leave that place where they're watching him. But then the angels appear and are like, look, you guys can't stand here and look up into heaven all day long. Go. Get to work because he's coming back. And so they do. But what was the example that Jesus set? Matthew chapter 9. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so Jesus looked out upon the group of people that was going to crucify him. And he had compassion for them. Now, when I uh, originally started to um, develop or, or, or see this truth in scripture uh, we were coming out of um, some wars in the Middle East and uh, uh, the thing I can remember saying was so Jesus is looking out upon a group of people that are here in a few days are going to crucify him and he has compassion for them it would be the same thing as us standing in the Middle East looking out upon a, a, a religion of people that had uh, flew planes into a building and us having mm -hmm. compassion for them. In today's climate, it might be uh, looking out upon a, a political party that we uh, are different than, or maybe we have differing ideas than. And instead of standing divided, opposing them, we have understanding, love for them. That's how lives are changed. Amen. My mental health counselor who gets a lot of my money I need often. He said, you don't change lives by standing on the other side of the fence trying to pull them over. You stand beside them and you see things the way they see things. And having taken the time to see things the way they see things, you say, okay, now let me show you how I see things. Oftentimes in life, we earn that right through our love and through our compassion. And that's the example that Jesus set. He looked out and he saw the crowds and he had compassion. And so what changes? Brief church history. Around 250 A.D., 
So a little over 200 years after Jesus ascends to sit at the right hand of the Father, um, uh, Cyprian of Carthage, he starts to talk about how uh, you know, th this New Testament church, it had grown and grown and grown 200 years. And so this leader comes along and he says, you know what? We need to separate uh, laity and clergy. And for the very first time uh, in, in New Testament church history, uh, we have a guy that has a, a, an idea that might be good, but it, it hurts the church. And, and that is dividing clergy and laity. Um, secular and non-secular, those things don't exist in the church. The moment you say yes to him, you're a part of the body. And no part of the body is any more important than the other parts of the body. We all play a role in this. And so he comes in, he's like, well, we need to, we need to create some separation. And, and so you have the ministers that are serving, and then you got this, like the average person in the church. And, and he starts to create a separation, a hierarchy in ministry. And then about uh, 60 years after that, 313 AD, Constantine through this like supernatural experience in his life, he, for the first time in history, legalizes Christianity. And so it's safe now, for the first time, to be a follower of Jesus. And he says, I love the church so much, I'm going to start to build buildings for people to gather and for this clergy, these super Christians that don't exist in the Bible, to work. And so he starts to build churches. It's not long after that not only are these buildings places for the clergy to work, somebody decides, well, why don't they just live there too? And the priests, they move in to these buildings or around these buildings, successfully plucking them out of the communities of people that they're called to love and serve. And now, if you want to worship, instead of us gathering together in our home, in our community, we've got to go somewhere to do that, as though that building is the place in which God dwells. That changed when the veil was ripped from top to bottom. We no longer have to go somewhere to get into the presence of God. When we say yes to him, we are the embodiment of the presence of God. And instead of the nations having to come to the temple, we go to the nations. Amen. But they're jacking it up. And so they build these buildings. And then you get to the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. You begin to see development of the Industrial Revolution. And then the church becomes a business. Very profitable. Run by these super Christians that don't exist in the Bible that we call clergy. And then we fast forward to the 21st century, and if we're not careful, we become a church that's more um, attached to a political party than people that are followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so we can go interact with a minister if we go to a building. And there became a trend where we wanted people to know Jesus, and instead of us having the ability to point him towards him, we said, come with me, let me show you somebody that can tell you about him. We became lazy in our ways, and we can go interact with a minister and have nice lights and nice music, but don't expect that minister to come to where you are. Mm -hmm. And in the process... We lost the purity of the care and concern of the early church. It started to fade away. And hear me, church, we must recapture it. Not as a body of believers, but as individual followers of Jesus. Um, even the term Christian, depending on what translation of the Bible that you read, if you read the King James Bible, uh, you know that that term Christian is only in there three times. 
weren't, we weren't known as Christians. Right. Disciples, yes, a lot. Apostles, yes. Followers. Uh, one of the terms that, that we were given early on was followers of the way. It started with Isaiah saying, make the way, and then Jesus saying what? I am the way. And so even the idea of that term, uh, it wasn't in, until Antioch, in Acts chapter 11, I think, that we were even first called Christians. And so, number one, getting back, the thing that made the early church different was they were people that were concerned about the hurts of people around them. And number two, they were confident in the name of the one who saved them. Again, I know I'm preaching to the choir in this, but in this story that we read about in Acts chapter 3, who do you think the hero is? It's Jesus. They were confident in that. But if we're not careful, we could say, um, you know, the hero in this story is the lame person. He had the faith to get up and walk. Or the, the hero in this person is, is Peter. Uh, he walks up to this guy that's never walked in his life, and he grabs him by his hand, and he says, get up and walk. Or maybe it's John, or maybe it's the people that sat him there day after day. No, none of those people are the hero in the story. The hero is Jesus. Peter says, he says, look, I don't have any silver. I don't have any gold. But in the name of Get up. Walk. I want you to see something. Just Acts chapter 3 and 4. That's it. Just Acts chapter 3 and 4. See how dependent the early church was on the name of Jesus. Let's go on a quick little tour. Acts chapter 3 verse 16. It's just two chapters. That's it. In his name. By faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Acts chapter 4 verse 7. When they had sat in the midst of him, they inquired, but what power or by what name did you do this? Acts chapter 4 verse 10. Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Two more verses. Verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among them by which men must be saved. Verse 17. But in order that it may be spread no farther among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Verse 18, so they called them and they charged them not to speak or teach at all. The religious people were afraid of the name because it's going to mess up this good gig that they had. <laughs> they said, look, don't talk about, do whatever you want, just don't say the name. Every morning that we wake up, demons all around shudder at the possibility of you mentioning the name. Of Jesus, because among mentioning his name, he must flee. Yes. Hallelujah. That's Amen. But Jesus. Amen. Verse 30. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Over and over and over again. It's the name at the center of everything. And so not only do I work, but I work for government. And it's tough at times. And so I find myself, because the fertile, the, the soil in the workplace is so fertile and ripe for complaining and, and tension and, and bickering, I park about a quarter mile from my office, and I'm walking in in the morning, typically very early, uh, about 10 till 6. And, and as I'm walking in, uh, I, 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 almost every single morning, 
have to remind myself who I am, why I'm here, and then I just simply say, Jesus. There's a, a constant reminder. If not, and I, 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 it's easy for me and all of us to get caught up in all the nonsense and not recognize why we're really there. Jesus. It represents his person. It, 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 it represents that I trust in his power. And then through our laid down lives, we show his presence. A little over 2,000 years ago, when the name of Jesus was preached, people were saved and lives were changed. When we preach the name of Jesus today, you know what the outcome is? It's the exact same. Lives are changed. It might not happen how we want it to happen or as fast as we want it to happen. But hear me this morning. You make a really lousy Holy Spirit, and it's not your decision to decide when hearts of stone are turned to hearts of flesh or when blind eyes are open. But you make a really good you. And so just trust in the one that dwells inside of you. Live out the call that he has upon your life. And then just trust him to take care of the rest. And so Jesus is the hero. He's the hero. Because he was and is sitting at the right hand of Father. And he's moving through Peter and John. And that's exactly what he wants to do today. Amen. Through our lives, into our children's lives, through every place that we go. Christ is at the right hand of Father and he lives in us. He works through us. It was Jesus that healed this man. He did it through Peter. And in the 21st century, he's wanting to comfort hurts through your life just the same. And so Jesus is doing the strengthening, but you and I are the ones doing the reaching out. It was Peter that had the guts and the care and the concern to reach out to this heart 2,000 years ago. And the same is true through us. It's us. We've got to have the guts and the concern and to see and feel the hurt to reach out to those that are hurting. Through his presence in your life and mine, we are the hands and feet of the person and the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. And it's time, again, I, I said from the very jump, I know this is who you are. I know it. I've seen it, I've heard it, I've watched it. I know it's who you are. But it's time that we realize that God wants to live this through us. And, and, and I'm here for nothing else today, just to, to reassure that you're on the right track, that you're following the right path, and that, that this care for the hurt and feel of the hurt in this community is being played out through your life. It is being portrayed through your lives. The gospel is being represented through your lives. And so the third thing is just simply this. The thing that made the New Testament church different was that they were committed to the glory of God and that he uh, worked through them. It would have been really easy for Peter to be like, yep, I'm the man, the rock. Jesus said it. Look what I can do. It would be very easy for us to be like, hey, look at me. I'm the nicest guy in town. That wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to share the gospel. Um, they were the retro reflection. The moon, uh, it's it said of the moon that it has retro-reflective qualities. That the, the surface of the moon, although it doesn't have its own light to give, somehow you and I sit out many nights at the light of the moon. Mm -hmm. But the thing that makes the moon unique is the quality that it has to receive the light from the sun and retro-reflect that to the earth. 
you and I, we don't have any light to give. But through our retro reflection, we have the ability to allow the light of Jesus to shine through your and I's laid down life. Now I'll close with this. Um, Mark 4, I believe to be the best example of the church. Now in Mark chapter 4, let's turn here so I don't mess this up. There's a storm. Remember, Jesus is like, let's all go out on a boat. And then this storm comes. And in some books, uh, it talks about he's sleeping. They're like, wake up. Do you not even care about us? Jesus stands up and uh, he uh, rebukes the wind, the power behind the storm. And everybody's good. Everybody's safe. But in Mark's um, telling of this moment, he gives a little bit more deeper understanding of what's happening. In verse 36 of chapter 4, the greatest example of a faith family. Leaving the crowd, they took him, they went into the boat just as he was and other boats were with him. So they're in this vessel and they're out in the water and a storm comes and they're about to drown. Things are going down very quickly. And because Jesus was in their vessel, they were saved. But we cannot neglect the fact that because they were saved, everybody else around them that would have gone down in the same storm was saved as well. There were other boats with them. And so since Jesus just so happened to be in this boat, Every other boat around them was saved as well. Amen. This is the church, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Just because Jesus so happens to live in your vessel, this earthly robe that we call skin, everybody that we come in contact with benefits. Because he dwells in you. It's the Colossians 1, verse 26, 27 truth. The moment you say yes to Jesus, he comes to dwell inside of you. Amen. Doesn't take anything else. No crazy prayers, no crazy talk, no voodoo, nothing else. You say yes, he comes. He's there. The fullness of Jesus living in you. There's no hierarchy of it, Christians. We're not super Christians and regular cat. We're just all followers of Jesus. Now, that manifests itself in different ways. Some of us have a greater propensity to do different things. That's awesome. But it takes every single one of us. You know, long before I was on some stupid TV, I was picking gum out of a carpet. It takes servant. Servant men and women that are willing to say, I love Jesus, and I just want to do whatever I can. Then, once he comes to dwell inside of us, he says there's evidence of that. That's over in Galatians chapter 5. We call it the fruit of the Spirit. The evidence is that we hate people that are different than us, and we talk bad about people, and we're so angry at the world. And we're afraid of what's happening. And we go, we buy all the toilet paper and bullets. Somebody does. I knew it was somewhere. <laughs> Probably at the Giacomo's joint. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. 
He says, Jesus comes to dwell inside of you. And this is how all the other vessels know. And then you go back to John chapter 12, verse 24, where it says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it falls to the ground and dies, it produces fruit. And so you say yes to him, your eyes, this, this miracle that is reserved only for the New Testament. Read the entire Old Testament, not one blind eye open. You get to the New Testament, blind eyes being opened everywhere. It's a miracle reserved for the New Testament because it is the image of salvation. I lived 20 years of my life not knowing that I needed him, and then one day my eyes were opened that I needed him. This is what happened to uh, Paul, right? Saul in the book of Acts. This is like scales. And so God says, now, eyes are opened. We say yes. He comes and dwells inside of us. He comes and dwells inside of us and something changes through the Spirit. And so we can toilet paper that fruit of the Spirit and keep it all for ourselves. Or we can hand it out. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And it falls to the ground and it dies. And what happens is when it falls to the ground as we're tossing it out there, it doesn't remain alone, but instead there's fruit. Lives are changed. The other vessels around us are impacted because it just so happens that Jesus is in this vessel. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the church. We see the hurt. We know it. It's all over. We feel it. One of the things that the Bible says about uh, believers is that we don't just uh, see it, but we feel it. That when you cry, I cry. Not just good, but also, or not just bad, but also good. When you rejoice, I rejoice. That's why the Bible is so clear about us not being jealous of others. We have that problem in the church. We pray for a revival, pray for a revival, pray for a revival that happens down the road, and we get mad that it didn't happen here. We need to check our hearts. So we, we hurt when other people hurt. We rejoice when other people rejoice, but we take the fruit that is evidence of who we are. We scatter it everywhere we go. And the promise is, not in your time, but in his time, he will bring fruit. Amen. One last story, and then I'm going to pray. You guys are awesome. I love you. Love you. One last story. So uh, my daughter, Isabella, she's 12. She's in the sixth grade. And she's learning about all these different religions, and um, it's, it's, it's all good. And... Um, uh, polyistic, monotheistic, all these different things. And, and they're, in, they're talking about Egypt, right? And uh, God love the Egyptians. Man, some crazy ideas and thoughts about afterlife and religion and all these things. So they build these pyramids for their leaders, for Pharaoh specifically, and, and to bury them once they're dead. And they go through all of this thing. But one of the things that they did was um, they, if Pharaoh woke up, they didn't want to be hungry, right? God forbid he'd be hungry. And so they put jars of wheat in the uh, pyramids with them when, when they were burying them. And so, uh, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years later, we go in and we find it all there. And they're there. We call them mummies, right? And there's movies about it. It's all this stuff. But they find these, uh, these, these uh, clay vessels of wheat. And somebody said... Well, you got this wheat seed. It's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. Let's see what happens when we plant it. You know what happened? It grew wheat. <laughs> that is a word for one of you, for many of you. You've planted seed years and years and years and years ago in a loved one, in somebody you cared about. You didn't see any fruit. On the surface, you haven't seen any change. And you love that person, and you agonize over that person, and you worry about that person. But hear me this morning. It doesn't matter that that seed was planted 50 years ago, or in the case of the Egyptian, thousands of years ago. Seed is seed. And it's only a matter of time until seed does what seed is intended to do. And that is to take root 
in their lives and produce change and produce fruit. So never take for granted or give up on the seed that you planted. And my God, don't ever get to a place where you say, I'm just not going to sow anymore. It will do what it was intended to do. God assures you of this truth. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. Father, open blind eyes. Maybe there's somebody here questioning your existence. Just open their eyes. Do what you do. Just have them say yes to you. Maybe there's somebody that's listening, watching. Just have them say yes. Yes, I need a Savior. Maybe they don't want to change. That's okay. But I assure you, your life will be better when Jesus is involved. So open our, eye, our eyes to that need. Let us see what happens when we say yes to you. And by that name of Jesus, let us be the men and women that you call us to be in Leesburg, Lake County, Central Florida, throughout this nation, and throughout this world. God, give us our why we continue to seek after those that are lost. Help us in that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I love